Welcome everyone, Michael Ferrara from Club D Sport, and uh, joining me today, I have a very special guest. Lake Speed Jr. <laughs> is here, the man um, who probably knows more about engine oil lubricants and piston rings than anybody ever wanted to know. Yeah, I think people would say that. <laughs> yeah, more than anyone wants to know. <laughs> but today, we are going to educate you guys out there to let you know a little bit about the history of piston rings and what to look out there if you're in the market to buy some you know, high performance pistons, you want to make sure you get the right set of piston rings. Mm -hmm. What should they be looking for out there? What are some of the technologies that are out there nowadays that uh, people should be aware of? You know, thanks Mike. You know, one of the things about piston rings is it's something that people just kind of it's so along for the ride with the piston, right? Because you get the piston, oh, what rings do I need? Well, whatever fits the piston. <laughs> whatever came, came in the box, box right? Right. <laughs> if the piston came with rings, that's even beneficial, right? I don't even need rings. I already have them. But if, I, if I'm rebuilding an engine, I already have pistons, and I need to put new rings in it. Well, mm -hmm. you're going to go with whatever size rings that came with the pistons. And you know, that, that's all fine, well, and good, but there are some limitations, you know. Over time, if you think about what, say, you know, Honda and um, Yamaha, Kawasaki have done mm -hmm. with motorcycle engines. I mean, these guys are turning 13, 14,000 RPM mm. all the time. Well, because of the mass in a piston ring, those guys a long time ago went to thin rings, right. you know, to metric rings that are, you know, one millimeter or less. Mm -hmm. Well, so today's state of the art and, you know, Formula One, NASCAR, mm -hmm. IndyCar, they run sub one millimeter rings mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a reason, not just because of mass, but also that reduction in friction. If you think about rubbing your hands together, mm -hmm. you do this for a little bit, you'll start building some heat. Right, right. right. Well, there's not only that friction from building heat, but if I go to a just two fingers together, it takes it's less friction, mm -hmm. less heat. So we know that heat can be the enemy of your engine, right? Right. You're trying to get that heat out of the system so you don't overheat pistons and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if I can reduce that friction, not only do I gain power, but also gain control. So something to think about when you're considering pistons is that ring package that comes along with the piston because mm -hmm. you may not need a bigger radiator, you might just need the thinner piston ring. Yeah, that's that's one of the big things, you know, it's with piston rings nowadays, it seems like you go thin to win. I mean, the thinner, the better. And and part of it too is back in the olden days, you needed to have this massive piston ring because the materials were crap compared that's to today. That's a great, <laughs> great point. Because if you say go just right here, say, the second ring is traditionally a ductile iron ring, which mm -hmm. in the old, old days you had cast iron. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, wrought iron fences are cast iron. <laughs> right, right? Right. And right. think about it, they're always broken. Why? <laughs> because cast iron's brittle. Right. So what they went to is a hardened uh, iron, which is a ductile iron, which is, it's still softer than steel, but it's still a little more brittle. Right? Mm -hmm. This is way easier to break putting it on than one of these. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this is a stainless steel ring. So when you go to that better material, mm -hmm. so stainless has got more elasticity, so it can bend without breaking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it can also handle more temperature. And then we go from say, these old school type of rings, which maybe were maybe molly coated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or cast or, or chromed, right? The traditional cast ring. Now you've got a PVD coating. So it's basically aerospace type coatings, mm -hmm. which are lower friction, thin film, this ring can literally outlast by an order of three or four magnitudes of what this can. Gotcha. Just because the material technology is better. And that's really the game changer in not only just out uh, racing, but also what OEMs are doing is mm -hmm. you're moving away from those older materials, which were cheaper, they didn't last as long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting into better materials, better coatings. and just like you coat wrist pins and you coat valves mm -hmm. to make better performance and better longevity, we're doing the same thing with piston ring technology. Very good, very good. Now, let's uh, let's start at the bottom. Where are we starting at the top? Let's start at the bottom and talk oil control rings. Oh yeah. So, you know, um, this You're is- You're a man uh, in my heart, by the way. Well, <laughs> the oil ring is overlooked. Like everyone wants to talk about these cool, you know, top rings, right. all this, thin, gas ported, gapless, right. all that. 
the Port Royal Ring just gets <laughs> overlooked. Like, he gets no love at all. He's like, Rocky Dangerfield. I'm dating myself by saying that. Right. <laughs> but, like, so, so one of the things about uh, oil control rings is most of the time, that traditional three-piece ring mm -hmm. is what we've all known when we've mm -hmm. looked at these things. You know, we've got our expander and we've got our two rails there. But there's also um, some two-piece rings out there. And, you know, we noticed one. This is an HKS piston. Right. And um, they actually interrupt the pin, which is one of the things I'm not a big fan of. You know, when I, when I design a piston custom, I try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. But when they do it, they kind of get away from it by, you know, using this um, built-in expander um, or what would they call it, expander, I guess? You know, well, it's, it's, it's its own oil support rail, right? Oil support rail, that's so, what I was looking so for. So what they call this is the scraper, mm -hmm. right? And this really is a great example of talking about oil rings. Right? right. So this is the scraper, and it has this, you know, U-shaped face to it. Because it basically just has, like, you have two rails here to scrape oil, right? These have two little edges on them to scrape oil. And of course, there's little holes in here to allow the oil to go back through and get to the drain back. So you've got your oil drain backs right here. So you, you allow that oil that's on the cylinder wall to get back to the sump. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's the job of the oil control ring, is to control the oil, to scrape mm -hmm. the oil off the cylinder wall because you know oil's got lower octane value than fuel. Mm -hmm. So you don't really want oil in the combustion chamber. Right. Because detonation is not your friend. It's certainly not the friend of your piston. So but back to this little piece. So this is the scraper. This has basically no tension to it. Okay. So it, if, it, if it was there by itself, it really wouldn't do anything. Because mm, nothing's forcing it against the walls right. to scrape the oil. So with this is a spring, and you can actually literally see the coils. So this spring is what gives this uh, thing tension, right? And you can see those little bit, those little ridges there. It's a spring, no different than a valve spring or mm -hmm. any other spring. So this goes behind and gives it, we call it energy, right? So you get that tension by putting the spring in behind it. Of course, it's going to fight me where I'm trying to do this live, of course, because <laughs> it's tiny and we're trying to do it live. So, of course, it's going to be <laughs> problematic. But you probably get the idea that if you put this spring in here, it's it, trying to force it's it out. It's trying to force it out, right? And that's what gives it the ability to scrape that oil. Well, no different is this. Mm -hmm. This is also a spring. So it's not just a spacer to have these apart so it allows the oil to flow back. What's interesting about this arrangement of the three-piece oil ring, mm -hmm. which is why we love it so much, is the width of this rail is what determines how much pressure is being put on the, the spring, on the expander. Okay, okay. Because the expander never touches the cylinder wall. Right. Only the face of the oil rail does. So the OD of the oil rail is the OD of the cylinder bore. Mm -hmm. The ID of the rail is what's touching these tabs, these little lugs on the oh, inside. Okay. So you I've see never these noticed those before. Look at that. There. Those tabs aren't just there to locate. It's what allows that rail to, to be pushed out. out. Yes. Gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Apply a force against the cylinder wall, so the scraper's pushing up against it. So the expander is setting the tension. So on a three-piece oil control set, mm -hmm. if you want more tension, you change that expander, you're good to go. Exactly. So think about it. If this expander is longer, mm -hmm. you can force it in. The trick, and that was the old way of doing it, right? So let's say you went to a boosted application, you're mm -hmm. running a really high viscosity oil. So Man, I need a lot of oil ring tension to scrape all that oil off. Because gotcha. I see high boost, I really don't want any oil in my combustion chamber because, again, detonation right, is right. going to be a problem. Well, the old way to do it was just run an oversized expander. Say, I might uh, run 10, 15, 20 thousandths bore size over expander in my bore. So let's say I had maybe a 90 millimeter bore. I may have gone with a 92 and a quarter or maybe a 95 millimeter or 90.5 or 90 gotcha. uh, millimeter bore expander and just squeeze it in there to make tension. Well, at some point, you can't fit it in there, right? Right. It starts to just waffle and it won't go. So we've come up with a process of using gas nitriding mm -hmm. like you do for other things. If you gas nitride that expander, it bumps it up three or four pounds of tension oh, wow. off the go. The other nice part is this spring, like any other spring, mm -hmm loses spring rate, loses tension 
over time with use. Mm -hmm. So that by gas nitriding the expander, not only do I boost my tension up, mm -hmm. I also make it where it's more stable. It doesn't want to lose that tension over time. So if you're doing high boost and you're using that higher viscosity oil, mm -hmm. going to a gas nitride and expander is a great way of getting that tension up so you get the proper oil control. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's look at the lower compression ring, also called the second ring. Yep. I'm sorry, I grabbed That's the wrong right. one. <laughs> um, now, traditionally, these were just cast iron and then mm -hmm. some ductile, and now even we're seeing steel uh, being used in this second ring. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the magic behind that second ring has to do with that profile, correct? Yes. In, in actually scraping the oil off? Right. So the top ring is typically what we call a barrel face. Mm -hmm. So it allows, you know, because the piston has a little bit of rock at, at top dead center right. and at bottom dead center. So by having a barrel profile, as that piston rocks over, you maintain contact. It allows for that gotcha. distortion. Okay. Because you want, because the top ring's all about cylinder compression. Mm -hmm. That's sealing combustion pressure. Gotcha. That second ring 80% of this job's ring, or, or this ring's job, is oil control. Oil control, gotcha. So what we did in the past was you had a taper face. Okay. So if you think about a wedge, right? Mm -hmm. So it's trying to use that point, and that point's there to scrape the oil off the cylinder wall by having that point. Okay. Didn't then, work too well. No, <laughs> it, it works really good when it's new. Okay. <laughs> but as it wears it off, now that it becomes flat. Gotcha. gotcha. So you lose that point. As it wears, it just becomes a nub out there. So somebody came up with a better idea. Let's undercut that taper face. So you still have the taper face, mm -hmm. but I undercut it. Well, now I have what's called a napier. Gotcha. So you get this point out here that can really scrape oil well. Gotcha. So gotcha. a napier second is what's been in vogue for a while because it can scrape oil better. And there's two reasons why you really want to go with a napier. Mm -hmm. But one is that one, it can scrape oil better. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. by itself, is, oh, better oil control. But number two, the more oil control scraping I can get from my second ring, mm -hmm. the lower tension I can get away with my oil ring. So now my whole ring package can have lower tension, which means more power that was being made from combustion can get in the crankshaft. Because you think about it, all the stuff that I've done in my life mm -hmm. is all about parasitic drag. Right. So between the oil and the piston rings, we're the guys who are robbing power mm -hmm. from the cylinder head guys. <laughs> the cylinder <laughs> well, head guys are working to try to get you know air in the engine. Yeah. The camshaft guys, <laughs> all my buddies in the industry are all about getting air into the engine right. so you can burn it and make power. And then my job is to say, well, I'm trying not to waste as much of it as I possibly exactly, can. Exactly. Because that friction from that, that piston ring to mm -hmm. the cylinder wall, that's going to be what, 30, 40% of the friction? Yeah, I mean, Ford Motor Company recently published a study where mm -hmm. they, after years, 40% of all engine friction is this rubbing against the cylinder wall. That's the piston crazy. ring is the number one source of friction in your engine. And of course, what's causing all that friction is the moving the oil. So mm -hmm. that's why we've gone to lower and lower oil viscosities over the year because this isn't running in the air, mm -hmm. it's running through oil. And all viscosity is, is a fancy word for resistance to flow. So mm -hmm. as a tribologist, friction wear lubrication and oil guy in, in piston ring, all I do is rob power from the engine. <laughs> so I'm just trying to be less of a robber, take less out of your pocket so you have more power getting the crankshaft. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, the upper compression ring or top ring. Yes. Um, you guys have something that's kind of unique. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it is very unique. I hadn't seen it before you guys came out with this, but it's actually taking that top ring, which like you mentioned before, there's better materials that can do better things. There's better coatings and all that. But the actual geometry of this is different by incorporating these lateral gas ports. Lateral gas ports. And it's actually doing, I think, uh, here's one of our, our Club D Sport pistons that we have for the VR38. That's actually has those lateral gas ports um, machined in into the piston. But a lot of the pistons that you buy off the shelf, you can't get the benefit of that but you could get the benefit of that if you have an off-the-shelf piston by just upgrading to these. Exactly. So here, here's a shelf piston, like you said before, mm -hmm. no gas ports. There's another shelf piston over here, no gas ports. And the whole idea of the gas port is to let that gas pressure get behind the ring. I mean, gotcha. gas porting a piston 
is old technology. It has been around for mm -hmm. a long time. Because mm -hmm. people figured out that, hey, I need to run a tight clearance between the piston and the ring. Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of clearance now the ring can flop around. So the higher the RPM you get into ring flutter. Mm -hmm. So if I can run a tighter clearance, I can control the ring better to not have ring flutter. But then if I tighten it up, now I don't have as much pathway to get that gas pressure behind the ring. Because it's not the tension of the ring that actually seals it. It's the gas getting up behind this and forcing that out into right. the bore, right? So by putting these 15 lateral gas ports, the slots mm -hmm. in the top of the ring, it's allowing that gas pressure to get behind the ring easier so it can force it out. So the great part of it is, as opposed to having a big giant, you know, one and a half millimeter or two millimeter top ring, mm -hmm. it's got all this tension in there trying to resist the gas pressure right. or you know, combustion pressure. Now I can go with a one millimeter ring that's way thinner, way less tension, mm -hmm. so much lower friction, but I actually get better ring seal because this can conform. So it seals and gives the pressure when you need it. So that at the high compression, high combustion pressures, that peak cylinder pressure, I'm getting maximum ring seal. And you can see it in the dyno. Mm -hmm. When you put a gas ported ring or a gas ported piston in an engine, it will always make more peak torque. Mm -hmm. Because peak torque is peak cylinder pressure. Right. So it's using, it's, it's ring jujitsu. It's using that gas pressure to help seal as opposed to trying to fight it. Well, well and the nice thing, when you have a gain on that side of actually getting more combustion uh, sealing, you're getting less blow by, you're getting less yes. crankcase issues to deal with, um, which can be a, a big issue on a lot of these vehicles. Well, I I've said before, your fuel and your blow by are the enemy of your motor oil. Mm -hmm. The motor oil is the lifeblood of your engine. So you want to protect your motor oil. So the best way to do it is good ring seal. Very good, very good. Now, this right here is a little bit of an illustration showing um, the new way and the old way. This is yeah, a uh, is. same manufacturer. This is Ross. Um, mm -hmm. They made this piston here for Buick Grand National. And you see the, um, you'll probably be able to eyeball the size of those rings. What is that? Like a... That looks like a 16th, 16th. 316, maybe even bigger. That could be a, that's, that's, that's a big oil ring. Yeah. <laughs> and, and taking that and moving um, to a, uh, is this a 1 or a 1.2? That's a 1.2. 1.2. Yeah, that's a 1.2. Yeah, that's a 1.2 top ring. And we this is a great combination because we've got a gas ported ring with lateral gas ports in the piston. So we're going to put all the cylinder pressure to it we can and know that we've got good ring seal. Very cool. And this was kind of a piston that we're actually going to be doing a test with to actually see when we went through this Buick Grand National engine mm -hmm. and kind of refreshing it, putting some new technologies in it. And with, at the same boost level that we had previously, we're going to see exactly how much of a performance increase we can get. Now, I know you guys, and the reason why you're out here in California right now, mm -hmm. you're over at one of the uh, racing engine builders over there and yeah. doing a lot of testing uh, with piston rings. And I know you've done a lot of testing. Um, gas porting alone, I think you told me the last time on some of that testing, um, you're seeing, what is it, somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, how much, I forget, I'm trying to remember like, now. I think you picked up about five or six power, horsepower last time. Okay. This is on a 400 horsepower engine, so right, it's right. a good solid 1%. Just going from a conventional, you know, non-gas ported piston. Right. With a non-gas ported ring, just putting a gas ported ring in that same piston, we picked up, you know, five, six horsepower. Right. You know, uh, which is a pretty good number uh, for that size engine. The big thing is we also saw a huge drop in blow by. I remember that, that crankcase pressure. I, you, you had that uh, that mechanical gauge thing yes. going on there, and it basically dropped it to almost nothing compared to what it was. Yeah. So it was funny because, you know, the, the rooms, the downer rooms pressurized. Mm -hmm. So you could actually see with the gas ported ring in there, you could see the engine as the RPM go up, actually looking at crankcase pressure watching that room dry out in terms of gas pressure. Uh, pressure. You're, you're sucking so much air out of the it, from the engine, out of the exhaust, the pressure in the room dropped and you can see it <laughs> with the pressure gauge. Whereas with a conventional ring, with no, all it was doing was taking off. The yeah. higher the RPM went, the more pressure was going because there was that much blow by in the crankcase. So it was neat to see that. Now, what we're gonna be doing uh, this week is we're actually going from that traditional thicker ring mm -hmm to the one millimeter ring. Mm. And we've already done it back to back with the uh, conventional styles, no gas ports. Okay. Tomorrow we're gonna do gapless 
and gas borders. We're throwing everything that kids just think at it to see gotcha. how much of a step is there by going both capitalist and gas borders. And I remember you, you telling me this before, the combination of getting a better seal and getting the right viscosity oil, you know, you can talk about picking up on a 400 horsepower engine, you pick up, you know, uh, 8, 10, 15 horsepower through the ring pack, but with the right oil, how much more on top of that can you get? I mean, I would say between the oil and the piston rings, if you optimize that, mm -hmm. I bet there's at least 30 horsepower right there. That's impressive. I mean, and that's just horsepower that's normally wasted to, to friction. That's right. just turned into heat. It's, it's a wasted horsepower. It's, it's a extra duress on the, on the oil and everything else. You know, here's one thing we've, we've seen over the years in several different engines doing dyno testing with oil stuff. Mm. And this is something that almost no one, I bet, pays really close attention to oil level okay if you have a stroker engine you've added stroke to the crankshaft right if you did not change your oil pan on a wet sump engine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to compensate for that if you still put the oil level back to full uh -huh. guarantee you you've already knocked 25 horsepower 20 horsepower out of your engine and you probably added about 10 15 degrees <laughs> of operating temperature to your engine because you've overfilled the engine because that crankshaft that oil level is designed for the stock stroke right so that's how far it goes down if i go add stroke right it's now going down and hitting the oil which is just going to rob power when we well, on the dyno, how we look at it is we look at oil pressure. Look at the oil pressure that it runs. So we want to see that oil pressure, if that pressure relief valve is holding steady, mm -hmm. we really shouldn't see a big increase in oil pressure. And the sign that you're overfilled is at the end of your long dyno pull, mm -hmm. if oil pressure drops. If you see oil pressure okay. dropping at all in a wet sump engine over the course, you're overfilled. That's the way to Interesting. Go. Very interesting. And I hadn't heard that one before. Right. Just a little bit. If it right. drops, say, three or four PSI toward the end of the run, mm -hmm. you're overfilled. Interesting. So, having um, the right combination of, of piston ring, having the right combination of the viscosity of the oil and using mm -hmm. the right oil, that's part of it, but all that gets kind of thrown out the window when the machine shop uh, doesn't do the correct surface finish, doesn't have the right geometry in the bore. Can you care to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so ring seal, I mm -hmm. always call it it's soup, it's not steak. So this piston ring has to work with this piston. And mm -hmm. it's gotta work with the cylinder wall and the motor wall. They all have to work in concert together. They're not in isolation. Mm -hmm. They're all interdependent. and that last part of this equation is the cylinder bore surface finish. And if you don't have a tool like that, the propolometer, that can measure that surface finish in micro inches, which is a millionth of an inch, mm -hmm. there's no way you're gonna know if you have the correct surface or not. And here's the real key. Back to the older piston rings mm -hmm. and newer piston rings, that material technology. So in the old days when we had the We'll call it maybe that plasma molly ring. So it's a ductile iron ring that has the molly spray on it. Mm -hmm. well, that spray molly coating made the ring break in easy, which is good, mm -hmm. but it's soft, so it doesn't live as long. But the one advantage of that ring is that that spray process held oil. Mm -hmm. So you could be really smooth and miss your surface finish by a mile, essentially, <laughs> and you'd still be okay because mm -hmm. the ring could hold oil. But when you go to the thinner rings, the steel rings that can hold more power and they, they're more durable, there's no porosity because there's nothing sprayed on here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a thin film coating. No pores means there's no oil retention. So now the onus is on the cylinder finish. So a lot of people know honing and thinking about RA finish because that's what was in all the books, right? That if you mm -hmm. use this stone, you get this RA number. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, RA doesn't tell you enough. That's, That's just an average of everything going on, and right. it could be good stuff going on and bad stuff going on. Right. And this you just don't know. RA and that RA are the exact same. Mm -hmm. You know, one of these is the bed of nails mm -hmm. that you don't, your piston rings don't want to be on, and the other one's like you know, little plateaus that can support the load. Mm -hmm. And I always say it's like doing push ups on your fingertips versus your palms. If we're doing this, you're going to get tired pretty quick. Mm -hmm. 
If you're on your palms, you can do it for a lot longer. There's more load bearing area. But so if I don't have any valleys to hold the oil, now my rings are gonna run dry. I'm gonna lose that gasket that the oil is between the cylinder wall and the piston ring. So that's why I have the profilometer to measure those valleys. We call RVK, mm -hmm. that's the key number, and that's what this device can give you. Yeah, so let's just uh, step over here. Sure. And I'll just show you how um, this works here. Can you use this? And cool that's an amazing thing. little tool, by the way, because you don't want to try to hold that by hand. Yeah, especially this makes this job so easy. Especially when your hand is coated in honing oil, right. it makes it even more fun. Yeah, when it's slippery and stinky. Let's see here. Of course, it's not going to work right now. Let's see. Oh, it's returning. returning. Yeah, it's going to return. It should be okay. Should be okay. The stylus okay. has got to come back. The stylus drags across. This little tiny diamond tip stylus in there. All it's right. got to do the job. Yep. Yep. Now it's back at home, and it's tracing that. Now, one thing to keep in mind here when you're looking at this scale. Mm -hmm. So that's right at plus or minus 200 micro inches. So that total is 400,000 or 400 micro inches, right? Okay. That is four tenths of a thousandth. Oh, wow. The total is four tenths of a thousandth. You're looking at that scale. So you're looking at that trace right now. Most of that's within a hundred. So that's one tenth of a thousandth is that complete surface finish. That is crazy. Okay, so let's look at some of these numbers. RA, that's our average finish right, right here. We're at 10. Um, RK, though, that's, that's one of the more important ones. That's, that's your core roughness. Core roughness, right? Mm -hmm. And that's at 29. And then um, RPK at 7.7 and RVK at 22.6. Now, this is a lot lower number than I would have expected on this. I think right. we that's would have liked to see. Pretty smooth finish. Yeah, yeah pretty smooth we finish. We like to see for, with a steel ring, mm -hmm. you want to see that RVK upwards of 45. Right, right. that's so always a number we're shooting for. Yep. Yep. Like today, we were doing that engine test in between each ring test. Mm -hmm. We're using the profilometer, checking the cylinders, make sure we got at least. 50 to 60 RVK so that we know that there's no variable you're throwing right. into this. So right. the more valley, the better, especially when you're putting more fuel to it. You go to say E85, an engine like this, right? This engine was made for boost, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? You're not going to run this engine today, right? You want to put some boost to it. And you probably want to throw some E85 at it so you can mm -hmm. run more boost because if a little boost is good, well, you know more is better. Right. You need more valley. So you would right. want to have those valley numbers maybe 65 to 70 if you're running a lot of boost on E85. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very cool, very cool. So this is basically, I like to call it the uh, electronic fingernail. And yeah. you know, machinists use it all the time because sometimes you'll look at a surface and you'll be like, oh, what is that? Mm -hmm. And you can see stuff that isn't actually doing anything. But when you take your fingernail and you drag it on a surface, that's when you see if there's actually something on a surface that uh, needs to be addressed. And that's a great point. You can use this tool not just for cylinder bores, but also for making sure the deck has mm -hmm. the right roughness for your MLS gaskets. Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, back in the days when people used a lot of composite gaskets, they were very forgiving. In fact, you know, some of those manufacturers are, or, or the, the, the uh, train of thought was, you know what, you know, leave it rough, it bites into the gasket, it holds it in place and stuff. And unfortunately, some of the machine shops that are machining Modern uh, blocks today still hold to that because that worked for them with that. But right. now an MLS gasket, that's the last thing you'd want. Right. Um, so, so this is actually you know a good way to see how it's move right there. Yeah, that's how it's working. So it's basically like a fingernail just dragging itself on the surface, recording what it's seeing there, mm -hmm. and recording both the valleys and the peaks, everything that's happening there. Like you said, the old days, those you know composite gaskets were forgiving, mm -hmm. kind of like those Molly rings were forgiving. Yeah. You didn't have to be spot on. I'm sure <laughs> you could have all kinds of crazy ideas about surface finish, and it would allow you to do that. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the better materials, steel gaskets, steel rings, now that surface finish is the thing you have to have in order to make this work. And an RA of 25 would be great for mm -hmm. an MLS gasket. This was fun. Let's see what the... Uh, RVK looks like. RVK of 131 on this. Right. So isn't that amazing to think yeah. that this looks smoother than that cylinder does, but there's actually more value in this, which just goes to show your eye eyes will lie yep. to you. 
Yeah, one of the things I, I learned, you know, in, in learning machine, becoming a machinist, basically, uh, one of the things that surprised me the most, surprised me the most, was how you have to use your other senses. You know, mm -hmm. it's not all about what you see and what you read on a on a you know a micrometer mm -hmm. or a, or a caliper. It's what you feel when you're machining something. Is it vibrating mm -hmm. or not? It's what, what you, you hear. hear. Yeah, <laughs> all those things. It's like it's incredible. You got to use all your senses. My kids always make fun of me. It's like, Dad, you can't hear anything we're saying, but you can hear this these these engines. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, you got all these people doing you know e tunes and stuff on cars or doing remote tuning. And to me, it's just like, wow, it's, it's tough to, to really endorse that because, you know, being in the car and feeling it and hearing it right there is... And smell it! Yeah, and smelling it, yeah, I mean, all these things, like, you know, is, 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 is that maple syrup or is that, you know, ethylene glycol? What do we got, you know, is this a head gasket lifting? Like, you don't know. Don't taste any of these things. You don't want to lick the block. You don't want to put the oil in your mouth, but don't do that. Now, this one here, this piston, uh, I think was kind of interesting because, you know, like I've, I've kind of talked about in the magazine before, if you're going to be designing a piston, mm -hmm. start with the rings. And yes. that's exactly what we did. We called you guys. We said, hey, what's the coolest kind of trick ring package we can use on this 4AG piston that we're going to mm -hmm. have built for us? You guys came through. You gave us all the dimensions. We gave it to the piston manufacturer. And they made the piston exactly what it needed to be to have the right you know, uh, clearances and, and everything for these rings so that they'll perform at its best. It looks pretty trick. Now, um, I don't know all the details, but mm -hmm. this looks like that's an anodized, some type of anodized groove in it too as well. Correct, correct. This has an electroless uh, nickel plating. Okay, perfect. Um, which works the same way as like an anodizing. It's a very hard surface. Um, helps to resist any type of the micro welding and other issues that you can get. And that's really key because micro welding, the worst time for micro welding is during break in. Mm -hmm. So that's a real critical time to make sure you've got clean, fresh oil. You've got, you know, tight micron filtration because essentially what micro welding is, for people who don't know, is when a piece of metal actually melts or basically embeds in the ring groove mm. and then welds itself to the piston ring. Because be it stainless steel or iron, if there's a piece of metal, a mm -hmm. ferrous, you know, iron containing chunk of debris in here, because engines you know, make metal during breaking. That's mm -hmm. in fact, mm -hmm. there's usually three or four times more wear during break-in than in any other time that engine's life. Mm -hmm. We can see it in the used oil analysis. A brand new engine is going to put out way high levels of uh, wear metals. Mm -hmm. Then over time, usually within the first two oil changes, it goes from up here down to there, which can be handy to add information to know as an engine builder. If you know what those levels are, during break-in, then you know what you should never see again for your engine. Right. <laughs> As opposed to what's high for a diesel engine, you can know what's high for your engine. Right. But that point being is that what you're doing either through hard anodizing or this electric initial process, you're making that ring groove harder. Mm -hmm. So it's harder for any particles to embed themselves. You know, which is nice about this nickel stuff, if I understand it right, mm -hmm is it doesn't leave the surface as rough in the ring groove as hard anodizing does. Because the, when that hard anodizing makes it rougher so that it can't seal as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I know from mm -hmm. our NASCAR days at Joe Gibbs Racing, we made the most power with unanodized ring grooves. Mm -hmm. But but <laughs> the longevity. <laughs> right. That was the challenge is because you had to get the engine to break in. Mm -hmm. You wanted to go to the racetrack. You didn't want to wear the springs out, so mm -hmm. you were trying to run the engine really hard really soon to get it to break in to make sure that you had the most power you got the racetrack. But if you did that, you yeah. might push it too hard because if you just baby the engine, it won't micro it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it may never break in either. So there's that balancing act that can be tough, and this kind of gives you that margin of error, especially if you're going to be putting a lot of boost to it, which is I'm sure that's the reason for that. Yeah, this one actually is going to be a nitrous application. So uh, we, we didn't same, talk about anything there. Difference. But yeah, with nitrous <laughs> oxide, what are we looking at? Anything different versus, um, you know, boost from turbo or supercharger versus nitrous? Is there anything else that's kind of different? Well, that's where you want to go to the steel ring. Right? Okay. So nitrous is doesn't like the Molly type rings because it typically, you know, the flame speed of nitrous is so fast mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that that shock that can hit the piston rings can actually cause the molly to flake off. So gotcha. when you're heavy nitrous applications, 
you want that PVD coated steel type ring, uh, it's what's best for that application. So typically, yeah, your super high boost nitrous, they tend to kind of come meet the same place. Mm -hmm. Steel, PVD, that's what you want. Having the gas force in there to get it to seal up because you don't want the nitrous in the, in the crankcase. You want mm -hmm. to keep it up here. Uh, so you don't get any like flame paths down the piston, you know, saws on your piston is never a good thing. Yeah, I would imagine. Now, now something- but you also want high oil ring tension. Okay. So when you have power adders, be it boost mm -hmm. or uh, nitrous, you're not trying to scrape every last little bit of power out of this engine by reducing oil ring tension. So right. one thing we do at Total Seal, we, we offer ring packages in standard tension, but we also have low tension and high tension. Oh, okay. So that you can bump that oil ring tension up when you've got a power adder, because when you get both on 200 horsepower, mm -hmm. who cares about the 10 you gave up there? Right. But you got better oil control, so I get by giving up 10 horsepower in ring tension, I gained durability because now I'm not gonna be getting oil in the combustion chamber, so I don't have to chase my tune mm. or risk detonating the engine based on uh, poor oil control. Okay, so now here's something I don't think I've ever asked you about. I'm gonna just wheel it in here. And uh, part of this goes out to the, I know the shootout audience is out there watching and you guys are like, why are you putting this stuff on our channel, man? You know, well, it's, we got some Mitsubishi stuff here this time, all right? Um, this is an actual engine we hope to have out at the shootout this year. And essentially what's happening, we're seeing it in a lot of different communities, but What's happening is, you know, these old cast iron blocks, it's getting harder to find ones that are still, you know, mm -hmm. not overboard uh, immensely or mm -hmm. in good condition and stuff. So we just started playing around with doing some sleeving on these. All right. And um, really happy how this one turned out. This is one that we're going to be pushing. Um, we actually have a dyno day coming up here, and we're hoping to see about 920, 940 at the wheels with this one. Nice. But the makeup of the cylinder is different. Instead of being a gray cast iron, you know, this is an aftermarket sleeve. This is a ductile iron sleeve. Um, what, would, what should I do um, with this engine that I wouldn't do typically with gray cast iron? Is there any differences there? If I know that it's going to be E85 and it's going to be high boost, what type of surface finish should I uh, be shooting for? What are those things that I should be considering? So the surface finish and say the ring stuff is really the same regardless of what the bore material is. Okay. Other than say Nicosil or Sumobor, some kind of plasma spray bore, totally different. But in this case, really what you're looking at is changing the stone, the abrasive you're using. The harder this sleeve is, because it is harder than the block. Right. If, let's say before you were maybe using a JHU 512. Mm -hmm. um, now you may have to use a JHU 412. You're having to go to a rougher grid abrasive because it's harder. Maybe you have to go from, say, maybe a 518, which is that 18 is a bonding strength, right. to a 512. I have to have an abrasive that's more aggressive to deal with the fact that this is harder. Gotcha. Gotcha. Kind of like with the sumo bore stuff, you know, the plasma spray bore. You have to hone it with diamonds. With diamonds, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's so hard, you got to use mm -hmm. diamonds. Yep. So this is one of those things when you sleeve it, you got to go in that direction because if you just hone the block and get the same numbers you would normally get to say gray cast iron, mm -hmm. and you do this, hone it the same way, the numbers won't be the same. Gotcha. Because this is harder. So you still want the same numbers to hold that oil, but the honing process, the choice of abrasive, the speed and the load, may have to change because of that harder material. Very good, very good. Cool, cool, cool. Well, that, um, again, those are all the things to get the durability, because as we all know, mm -hmm. anybody can make a hero run. Yes, on the, the, the one-run wonders, yes. The one-run wonders are out there. What's harder is to make it repeatable. Mm -hmm. right? We were working on a boosted engine for the Engine Performance Expo last year, and the cool thing about it is, Okay, it made 1,300 horsepower mm -hmm. at 18 pounds of boost. It's a 392 uh, cubic inch LS engine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's cool about it is that engine can make that same run over and over and over again. We got you know 40 runs that engine. Right. You know, 12 of them are over 1,300 horsepower. Mm -hmm. So it's not a one-hit wonder. It's th this engine's capable of doing it over and over again. And you get that way by having all the attention to detail. Mm -hmm. It's not just having, oh, 
that brand piston or that brand ring or whatever that is. It, you got to right. go way beyond that in looking at those subtle details. You know, a guy the other day was saying that, you know, the difference between failure and success is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. The difference between success and excellence is subtle. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the little things that get you to that higher level. Definitely, definitely. That attention to detail is, is really, like you said, you got to look at the whole system. It's it's a soup, as you say. You know, it's not just, hey, I'm buying, you know, some, some great ribeye steak here. I'm going to have a great dinner. It is what's in that soup, and one bad ingredient in that soup, it spoils it. Well, you know, a great uh, story to back that up is when I was at Joe Gibbs Racing, mm -hmm. we entered into this development partnership with a company called Lubrizol. They're one of the largest companies in the whole world that makes the additives that go into the different brands yep. of oil and fuel. And we had this little skunk works team there mm -hmm. and they had some of these physicists and chemists and stuff that would come in and they would come visit the shop. The first thing they'd always want to do is look at parts. They didn't want to talk about oil mm -hmm. or chemistry. They wanted to look at parts and they wanted to check surface finish. They wanted to talk about coatings. They were interested in the metallurgy and the geometry of things before they ever began talking about chemistry. Very interesting. And that's the oil company asking these questions, right? Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> the smartest guys in the whole world with motor oil didn't want to talk about oil. They wanted to talk about, what, 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 what coating is this? What's that geometry? How much rock? They wanted to know that stuff because from there, they could figure out, okay, what's the chemistry we need to optimize the suit? Now, just to make, um, you know, we talked about before thin rings, mm -hmm. and I know on the import side, you know, we've been using thin rings for a long time, and we're comfortable when, you know, everything went from being, you know, 1.5, 1.2 to 1.2, 1.2, or 1.0, 1.2, now 1.0, 1.0. You know, mm -hmm. we've kind of ridden that and really haven't had, you know, much uh, uh, resistance to that. But right. I know... I, What's the domestic side? I gotta believe it's it's driving them crazy to think they, they gotta you know they're used to using these giant rings oh, oh, and now yeah, yeah, yeah. are they just freaking 54, out? 554, 316. If you're at metric conversion is a 564 top ring uh. is two millimeter. Wow. So they were used to having two millimeter, two millimeter rings, <laughs> and now we're making thirteen hundred horsepower reliably with one millimeter rings, and they're like, no, there's no way, you can't do that. And like, well, don't tell the engine that because it just did it. It just made 10 pulls at 1,300 horsepower with a one millimeter ring, mm -hmm. and you pull them apart, and everything looks great. The cylinders look great. Service finish is good. The rings are healthy. Oh, and they were gapless and gas ported, by the way. Mm -hmm. So you took this little bitty one millimeter ring, and you chopped all holes in it and did all that. It's the material technology mm. that allows these things. And like I said, the import side has been embraced it. They're way ahead of the curve. The domestic guys, they're slowly catching on that, you know. Well, thank God, you know, the LS engine actually didn't come from the factory with five four rings in it. So right. They, they'd still be stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of those things, too, you, we were talking about with, um, you know, I, I think people, when they find something that works, they tend to stick with it. Yes. And unfortunately, they get comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. But just because it works doesn't necessarily mean it works the best that it could. It couldn't be optimized or there's more performance left on the table. Right. And I think back to the, the temperature difference. You know, when we're running these engines with big rings in it, mm. and you're generating all this temperature, you know, water temperature and oil temperature. So what are you doing? Now I'm, I've got you know, bigger radiators. I've got oil coolers. I've got all these other things in my car. Mm. There are just places, it's, it's more weight, and there's more things that go wrong. Mm. If I go to a thinner ring combination, regardless of what horsepower it makes, if I bring that engine temperature down, now from a car packaging mm -hmm. scenario, I can have a smaller radiator. I don't have to have this big a duct here. It, it, it just makes things easier. It was one of the biggest things we did in NASCAR when they used to have the two-car draft deal. Right. Is we really worked hard on trying to get the temperature of that engine down because when you were starved for air uh, makes sense temperatures went up and that's really where a huge gain came from and it's like so that temperature part of this equation some of the people shouldn't overlook very interesting now i know you guys are out there i don't know how many are following or actually asking questions live right now but if you guys have a question that you'd like to ask us um please shoot it off to us right now otherwise um we are gonna hopefully have you back here a number of more times. Right.
It is 14th in my living in North Carolina, so I know I find myself here in Southern California <laughs> on a fairly regular basis, and it's a pretty easy drive down here. It's a great place to hang out. And every, you go a little bit of time, I got to smell honing oil, so I had to come in. Very good. Do we got a question? We do have a question uh, from Chris Walker. Uh, he says, what are some benefits from using dashboard rings? Is it only beneficial for boosted cars? So boosted or in A, you're going to get better ring seal. And so if your, your pistons don't come with gas ports, if you have non-gas ported pistons, the easiest way to upgrade the performance mm -hmm. of that piston is just by swapping that top ring and putting a gas ported top ring in it. And especially in today's environment where parts supply is challenging, mm -hmm. it's easier to find shelf pistons and lead time shorter typically than custom pistons. Right. Uh, like we did with the, the boosted LS engine. Mm -hmm. You know, Mala Motorsports had some really great off the shelf, one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter pistons available that we could buy that day. Mm -hmm. So they sent us those pistons, and of course, those pistons didn't have gas ports. So what did we do? Put a gas port ring in it, bang, now you have a race quality piston because it's the right material, right kind of forging. Mm -hmm. It just didn't have gas ports. We fixed that by just swapping a ring. Very cool, very cool. Anything else out there? Uh, not right now. Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys all for joining us. Yes. Now, this segment here that we did live, um, we're going to hopefully be doing more of these and incorporating them all in our new show that's be coming out very soon called DSport Live. So make sure you uh, follow us on all of our social feeds so you know exactly when that's going to launch. And uh, Lake, I want to thank you very much for coming down, and uh, we look forward to your next visit. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Have a good one.